here back again and I have the pleasure to welcome these four fantastic ladies that they will uh, tell us everything about animated documentaries and women in animated documentaries. So I will present you Katerina Athanasopoulou. She's Greek and based in uh, uh, London. Actually, all of you are based in London. No, 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 it's not true. Uh, but uh, you you are from UK, yes, that's correct. Okay, so uh, Abigail Addison, producer, uh, Samantha Moore, animator, uh, actually your teacher and your teacher too. Okay, we have two teachers, animators, directors, producers, and Dimitra Kuzi, who is the moderator and who is also uh, producer, director. Are you teacher as well? Yes. Okay, so. I, it's going to be really interesting. So welcome. Now, okay, good, well done. The moderator doesn't know how to use the mic. <laughs> Very nice introduction. So welcome everybody. Uh, we have three great ladies here and artists and uh, producing is an art itself and I will start uh, from the beginning with a banal question to give us a framework of how, how you started, how you ended up here successful sitting on this panel each in your uh, expertise. Please some, some more. No, you have to give her this mic. Okay. <laughs> okay, what do you want to say? Pardon? Yes. Everything. No, no, no. The <laughs> idea is to, to give us a brief, oh, okay. a brief introduction of where you are now because you have already yeah. a, a whole uh, CV back. Okay, sure. we want to yeah. know a bit more about you. Yeah. So, um, so my name is Samantha Moore. I, um, I was born, no, no, it's fine. Um, I, I um, originally studied English literature and fine art painting, and I became interested in animation, um, but the animation that I made was always about real topics. So then I discovered there's a name for this, and the name helps you get funding um, when you call it animated documentary, because there was a time when it wasn't really a thing, and then when you started calling it the thing, people would go, oh, you do that thing. Um, and um, <laughs> so uh, I, I started with a documentary that I made about um, sweet peas about plants. Um, I continued with a documentary I made about my experience of having twins and the twinning process and multiple births and I have continued until today where I'm here in competition um, with a film about knitting and what it does for your brain. Okay, Very good. Yes, and um, Abigail is, is the producer. Yeah, so uh, I produce not just animated documentary, I do fiction projects as well. Um, and yeah, I'm very happy that I've worked with Sam on four films now. Um, so I've been producing for about, I've been working with Animate Projects, my production company, for 17 years, which when I have to do the maths, that hurts my head a little bit. Um, I know I only look like I'm 12, I know. Um, <laughs> Um, but yeah, I'm not an animator. I'm one of those um, imposters that comes in and um, tells animators what to do, essentially. So my background is actually English and drama, so I'm really interested in storytelling and character and acting and dialogue, which is what I hope I sort of bring to a, a collaborative partnership with people like Sam and Katerina. Yes, you're, you're very precious because you're a creative producer and that's a rarity. Huh? Okay, and you, Katerina? Uh, hello. Uh, yes, yes. Um, I started, um, my first degree was in painting and I moved to England and because I wanted to, to do animation and I am grateful for animation because it's the one way that I know how to make films um, about all these things that are in my head. But in terms of animated documentary, what I love is the possibility of translating spaces. In my current practice, what I do is I walk with a 360 camera, so it's a documentary practice that is peripatetic, in the very mundane sense that we have as Greeks, where a peripatos is that thing that your grandfather and grandmother does. So I stroll within a, a, a space and I capture it with a 360 camera and translate it into photogrammetry, 
In this sense, it's a documentary practice because it is a real space that I have measured through my feet. But then through bringing in the virtual cameras of CGI animation, I'm able to construct time also. And there is no other way, um, there is no other way of being a poet in the, in the sense of what you can do as an animator. Yes. And it's, it's difficult enough to create and, and uh, develop and produce document uh, not documentaries, okay, my feet, but uh, animations, but you are in a niche of the niche of documentaries, animated documentaries. And why, why is that? What, what is so, so interesting in, in that? Well, because also we're the only people that can do it. Because quite often animated documentary and non-fiction film in general comes where a, a live action camera, so like a, you know, a cinematic camera cannot enter because it's something that has happened in the past, because a camera cannot go there, because it's something that's only in your head. Um, it is very, very true, but it's not created through a photographic lens. Um, so animation is there because people also ask us to make films about things that are intangible. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot of that Sam can say also about, yes. about that. But so, so your work starts in, in any case with a subject. You have a subject which you, you, you don't really know how to describe and then, and then what is the process, what is the creative process. But I, I want, Abigail, I want you to, to come and jump in this discussion because as a creative producer, I guess that you also have a role in that to trigger this creative process in discussions and, and uh, so on. Well, I mean, it really should start with the directors because they're the ones that come with the ideas. So, um, yeah, I just have to make sure those ideas get realized, ideally, if we yes. can find the money and the resources and the people. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's really to Sam and Katerina and what the ideas they come with and how I can help them to, to realize those ideas. Okay. But was the idea of uh, connecting science and animation Sam's idea or your idea in, in, in that uh, work she created? Yeah, so we did a project... <laughs> we did a project between 2013 and 2017. That's right, that's the dates. So we, we'd already done a couple of animations, which we didn't necessarily call documentaries, but they worked with science um, in sort of experimental ways of responding to scientists' words. Um, and there was a fund, uh, there's this biomedical charity in the UK called the Wellcome Trust and they did funding for arts projects. So we were talking to them, they were really interested in the potential of animation, so they were really happy to support us to do a large scale project where we got six artists and six scientists, which we sort of did a sort of speed dating, we sort of found people, so we, we found artists that we knew were interested in science. Um, so Sam was obviously someone who'd already made films about, I think you'd already made your synesthesia film by that point. Um, and then we sort of put a call out for scientists. So the scientists came to us having no idea. Um, most of them hadn't worked with the artists before. So we were kind of as producers navigating that relationship and managing the expectations of both sides so that the scientists would understand that the artists weren't making um, like visualizations or they weren't making like informative films about their research, that this was very much about art and an art project. So very much driven by the directors rather than the scientists. It's, it's interesting and funny because science is in, in you both, although it's a completely different approach. C can you talk, talk about a bit about it, please, both? About the, the way you approached science because you, you mm. went in this lab and you made them crazy with interviews and drawings. I did, <laughs> I did. I did. Yeah, I think, it's, I think most animators will recognize that when you move, when you, when you work with people who don't usually work with animation, they have no real idea how animation functions. Um, I had worked with on a synesthesia project about um, an eyeful of sound about audiovisual synesthesia. So my PhD was about how animation can be used to document the kind of the internal about you know sort of brain states that one in one experiences individually like i worked with people who have phantom limb syndrome and i worked with people who have prosopagnosia which is face blindness um, and it's always really interesting because everybody always thinks they know what animation is they're like oh you do cartoons for kids and they're like 
no, actually, I'm a very serious animated documentary maker. <laughs> and I genuinely think that's why animated documentary as a phrase is quite helpful to us because it immediately distinguishes what we do from away from like cartoons. There's nothing wrong with um, work that's directed at children. There's nothing wrong with, you know, with fiction, but yet that is not what we do when we make an animated documentary. And it allows us to kind of just make a space for ourselves because animation is so amazing, so plastic, so incredible, like it's a super discipline, but everybody treats it like it's a tiny genre, a tiny element, like how's your little film going along? I can't be the only person who's asked this question and I want to throat punch them, frankly, when they ask me that question because it's not a little film, it's six years of my life that I've given blood, sweat and tears to. How dare you speak about my work this way? But that's why you get a PhD, so you can look down on them. Um, <laughs> especially when you are a woman, I guess. Well, uh, that doesn't always help. No. People patronizing okay. you is not is something that's really familiar to us. And so when they do it in a work context, we're like, oh, I've been here before. Yeah. 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 Do you, Katarina, do you feel the same? You work with, with VR, but... but... Um, yes, I, I started working with VR, um, but what I was most interested in is how the body moves in VR, so that essentially, VR is also a kind of theater because what we have is we have bodies that animate VR from the inside. Uh, but at the same time, VR depends on animations. So I like to think of the word animate, not only through the idea of animation, but in the fact that we are all animate creatures, meaning that we are alive and we experience the world through movement. So what I do with my um, doctoral studies, I walk places with a 360 camera and then I create this photogrammetry model. And in the case of the film that I'm here with, uh, which is called The Distance Between the Staircase and the Sky, uh, the film is based on a real polykatechia in the center of Athens, which has got a, a, a lovely internal staircase of eight floors. So I walked these eight floors up and down, and the building became a photogrammetric model, which I then played with AR with a poet inside the building itself. And actually, uh, Sotiris Kutsukos, who is my poet, is in the festival and I'm really happy and I can't wait to meet him. So we played with this in AR and then he wrote a poem. So my work, and that's how the film came to be. So the poem is also like the internal staircase inside the film. But it is a documentary practice because this is a real building with real bodies, with real stairs, with real movements. The last thing I want to say is, because I know I'm talking too much, it's one of the things that really irritates me as an animator is that often people think of CGI animation as something that computers do, which is rubbish. Because we don't just, we don't just create animation through telepathy with the computer. We don't just sit there and will it to do something. We do things also with our bodies. We do things with our hands. It is also handmade. We do it with our entire body. You know, We play with our keyboard. We play. My computer is my piano. Thinking of Joao, actually. Um, so, it's all about moving bodies and then a film becomes that thing that brings us all together in a room a little bit like this so that we can create a sense of place together. So now I have three questions which fit after what she said. What, 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 which one should I pick? One, two, three. You, you, you say. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Okay, three. Okay, it's about music because she talked about that the body is involved and the music, etc. And, and I know that you start with, uh, with the music, of course. And you first have the music composed or, or some, this happened with one of the films, I guess. So, or with all of them. And then you start on it building up the film. I will come back to the second two questions because they're good. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what do you think about the, the, this process? Can you tell us a bit more about it and about how you work with the composer and the music? So, um, and sound and sound also because the, the interviews are super important and, and the, all the dialogues you have in the documentary yes. you make. I think that um, music is really important. It's not normally the music that gets made first, but maybe you're thinking of the project that we did um, with Klang Forum Vienna. Yes. Okay, so Abigail produced um, some of the films on that. So I made a film called Bloomers, which was... I'm talking about Bloomers. Oh, okay, cool. Um, so that was a film about knickers, about a knicker factory in Manchester, and it was animated on 80 meters of crepe de chine. Um, and it was very much about the kind of materiality of 
the fabric. So it was all animated um, on TV paint and then exported as JPEG sequence. And then I hand printed it onto the crepe machine and then put it onto the camera and shot it. So, and in the end, we, I know, it sounds like a mental it's thing. It's so easy. She's just <laughs> no, doing no, no. it. <laughs> Yes. It's one of those things in the pitch was like, oh, yeah, that's a really cool idea. And then it was like, now you have to do it. I nearly <laughs> should have really thought it through. Anyway, um, at the end, the fabric gets turned into, into a pair of knickers and it's animated. And the women in the factory made the knickers for me in various different stages. So it was a really kind of lovely connection. And in that, that project, I mean, Abigail can talk more about this from a kind of holistic perspective, but we work with composers, contemporary music composers. Um, a group of all-female composers and all-female animation directors from all over Europe. Yeah, and I suppose what is um, significant about your film is yours was the only animated documentary out of all 10 of the films. So you were the only one that chose to have voices. So you were the only one with dialogue, which then had to be, because it was English, it had to have subtitles on the screen as well. So you added layers of challenge to what they were expecting you to produce. <laughs> but working with the composer, um, yeah, that was really interesting because it was sort of coming at it. Often when we, because we're coming at it from the animation perspective where we are, working very closely with composers, but they are, in a sense, working to us. So we're expecting them to deliver music for a film. And they generally do come in at the beginning and will work kind of collaboratively over however many years it might be we're making a film. But in this case, it was because it was coming from a music ensemble, so the composer had a very high status. So we had to kind of come at it where we're both trying to work harmoniously, but with very sort of different very different languages kind of coming at it. So we were working with someone who was very avant-garde, but thankfully that was it to our favor because she used, she came to the factory, she recorded sounds of the factory, like um, a steam iron and things like that. She was recording all these machines and then she went away and then translated that into music. music. She notated it, she, she did it with musical instruments rather than just using the actual factory sounds. <laughs> you know, she turned into the score and the score is very, yeah, it's very sort of mechanical and it sort of brings very different um, tone to it that I think we might have chosen if we'd have been working with one of the composers we regularly work with or you know she she was a very sort of different kind of composer so she can also use that piece of music and play it with her ensemble and you know as part of, of her music and we also you know have it as part of our film that we can screen which is you know so it's it, it benefits everyone can I add something? yes please one of the things that I love about bloomers is that, you know, in, in Greek, when uh, Sam says the word like bloomers or pants, it's a bit like if we say the word kilotes. So it's like, it's about a factory where these people are making underwear, you know, and this, it, it, it is such a stunning film. And it is a film also about the beauty of everyday life. And I think that is something that animation does so beautifully. Like it's about the poetry of everyday life, the poetry of, of, a, of, a, of the sound of a sewing machine and, and, and the presence. And I think that is also what is crucial about animated documentary, that we tend to go to those places. We don't just, we don't just build them as sets, we don't just imagine them, we find them and they're unique and they're unique in the same way that this chair has been made into this chair because there have been lots of bodies that have rubbed against it. And, and, and I feel that that poetry is in your film so strongly. Yes, it is. Have you have you watched this film? Do you, do you know this film? It's it's on Vimeo. It's on Vimeo. You should watch it. So so of course that leads me to the other question I was saying: the difference between the artist and the artisan. Uh, what what is it in your opinion? Is uh, you do both, I guess, or? Am I wrong? Or? Yeah, no, I think no, I think it's a really interesting question, and I think it's one that per we're perpetually fighting with as animators and animation directors, because animation, you know, you're a live action documentary maker, and so nobody expects you to be able to do every single job when making. You expect you to work with other people, but as animation directors, we're often expected to animate every frame, and we have a connection to the craft of animation and an understanding of the craft, which I think is really unusual um i've just directed a stop motion film and i don't do stop motion animation so for the first time i was unable to animate i did animate some 2d bits because i always felt weird um but there is most of it is stop motion animation and um it was a very strange experience being separate from it although i knitted the characters that are being animated so i still had my kind of tactile connection um 
I think it's a I think it's an uncomfortable one in some ways. I think someone like Joanna Quinn, you know, who kind of is such an amazing, you know, her drawing, her animation and her direction are all beautifully wrapped up together in the practice. And there's a real kind of like visceral link. But I think for lots of animation directors, you kind of veer onto the sides more of a craftsperson, you veer onto the side more of a director. Mm -hmm. And when you add documentary making as well into that mix, it's like you have to be a special kind of masochist. I wish the cruise and documentary would be that big and we would have so many people around us, but it's many times, it's it's two people, as you know, sound and, and camera, and most of the times you do sound or camera or both. Uh, okay, but um, yes, but Katarina, you wanted to say something towards it's this. Just, uh, for me, I'm, I'm, yes, I'm the, I'm the director, but I'm first uh, the audience. Because oh. the, the way that I make films as an independent, and that is actually why I make films and often, you know, self-funded films, is because I can, I can make something and then I can keep watching it. And I feel that is why I consider myself first an animator. And I think there is nothing in life like being an animator. Perhaps the second best thing is to teach animators because they also come in and they're so excited. And, um, and so, yes, we are our own, uh, you know, we're the director, but we're also the runner. I make excellent coffee for myself. Um, but also that is where the beauty of collaboration comes, especially with my composer. And my composer in my last uh, two, three projects has been Savas Metaxas. And in this case, with my poet, uh, Sotiris Kutsukos. Because, or, or when I have worked with you, Abigail, as my producer, there is a sense of, a be the beauty of dialogue and a dialogue does not have to be like a massive you know it doesn't have to be super polyphonic it can also be something that we whisper to each other and it becomes rich by repeating it abigail uh, you wanted to add something yeah just quickly yeah just to say about animated documentary i think that that is so true that point and beautifully made um but i think the dialogue as well with the interviewees the collaborators as i would consider them to be which are the people that you make the films about quite often in live action documentary they talk about sorry, they talk about the subject and i really hate that term for the subject you know it's like you're subjecting this person it's like they're just an object almost um and i think it animated documentary allows you to invite the interviewee into your film and invite them to be a collaborator that they can they can physically make their own mark on the frame it's not just about you the kind of you know director being in charge of everything so since we talk about uh, objectivity and science before that science is objective and uh, it, it has an object it's it's it, it's not objective. Okay, we start with a no. But, but anyway, I, I want to I want to talk about the truth, the truth in science, uh, which, which is perhaps objective. How about the truth in the documentary, uh, which is is it objective? How is how do you feel about that? Oh, and, and the question is goes to all of you, because there. How, yes, she's good in that. Okay, yes. The, the 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 idea was to make Abigail speak more because <laughs> she was the one who wanted to keep keep silence silent. So we I think we managed that. <laughs> My job is behind the camera. You oh know. wow! Okay. Um, no, I mean, I, I think that's one thing that we always find interesting, like working with scientists, is like this idea of objectivity and truth, and they're very. Although we're lucky that the people we work with are very generous and and don't see themselves like that and really want to collaborate and want to have their, you know, being a scientist, you are posing a question and you're trying to answer that question, but you know that you might not answer that question the way you want or that someone else will come along and break your, you know, you think you've got the answer, someone else will come along and they'll have a different thing, you know, and that's how science evolves. It's no ultimate truth. It's always just about what you can, yeah, what you can discover and how you can push things forward. So I think, you know, and we're lucky that the people we've collaborated with have just been so open about sharing the doubts and sharing their own, um, subjectivity and you know Sam's film loop is all about you know she gets the scientists to draw how they imagine a process we cannot visualize and all of them drew it in such different ways and then when they all looked at it together it was like oh this is how we all see it like it was the first time Sam had gotten to think in a way they hadn't thought about before in their lab and because they found that quite exciting being challenged to do that and also being good enough to accept that challenge and not just sort of shy away from it and say, oh no, we can't possibly make ourselves look stupid and draw, oh, I can't draw, you know, and they do these like scrappy drawings or whatever. 
um, you know, we've since gone on to work with Serge and his lab again because they really enjoyed that process of working a second, with a second an time. Yeah. Yes. Okay. That that's great. They they invited you a second time to do a second film. But uh, can yes. I add something? Yes, to yes please. Um, there is a there is a big issue always in terms of truth and in terms of objectivity that actually affects affects artistic knowledge as well. In the in the social sciences, there there is a, a like a binary between what is called the nomothetic and the ideographic. So the nomothetic is about like the, the, the you know the big the big laws, the big truths. This is the truth. This is the thing that is in books. This is the thing that is generally true and stands for everybody. You know, all birds do this. All cows do that. But the other school of thought is called is the other way of study is the ideographic study, ideographico, which looks at the specific thing, which looks at this this person, this room, not just any room. So like in animation, I feel that we touch the singular thing so much more. It is not just about every person in the world, it's that person. It's not about all animation. It's what comes out of her hands. So this is a thing that animation does. And at the same time, you know, if you think about it, all of the films that people go and watch in cinema that consider to be cinema, you know, they use VFX, which is also a kind of animation. In many ways, everything is much more animation, a lot of the objective things, than, than we even know. It's just that animators tend to hide behind the shadows, you know, like the Wizard of Oz. And you, and you manage to engage creatively people who are in, involved in your work, or uh, this, this is, this is, it's a risk somehow. So yes, what, what kind of other risks have you uh, taken in your life as an animator, as a woman director, and as a documentary uh, animator? For me, it's a compulsion. Like I can't, I can't imagine life without making images that move, and that's why I feel so incredibly lucky. Because you know, when you're a child, and some people want to be astronauts, you know, what I liked was um, to watch animation on the telly, and now I am still making animation. And you know, like, like I, I, like I say to my students. Every time that an animator starts animating, they reinvent animation, and there is no single film like, that is like another film. Even if you try to copy another film, it's always going to be a little bit unique. And that's why you can see films that were made in the 50s and look like they were made today. And that's why you see films made today, and you think, was this made in the last century? You know? And that is the magic of animation, that is a handmade magic, even if we do it digitally. So how do you create your personal style, since every time it's completely different? Then we do it. We find out. We're surprised by it. I think, I think most people that are in this room that are animators, you know, even when you start with a plan, you're still surprised by what happens, you know? It's always experimental, always. I think maybe even more so with animated documentary, because you'll know if you make documentary that like even when if you get funding for it for example and you go to your funder and say i want to make a film about such and such you have no idea what's going to happen with your with your collaborators with your interviewees whatever it is you're going to call them you know i made visible mending which is which abigail has um, produced as well and is part of the program on saturday which is a, knit, a film about knitting and the effect on the brain um but the key interviewee um died of liver cancer in the middle of the shoot you know and obviously there was no way we could anticipate that was going to happen I was working with a group of older knitters um, but she was the youngest so it was really you know tragic and awful but at the last she said to me would you could I do another interview with you and it was like oh my goodness you know and yeah of course the human part of me says that's appalling and the animation director part says oh yeah I'd really like to that would be you know just an incredible document of somebody's life and work so these things happen and you have no control over that. That's extremely extreme case. And yeah, Kate was an amazing person, but um, just on a more basic level, you know, making a film about knitting, I can't do stop motion animation. I mean, I really can't, I have very bad depth of vision. You know, I'm a terrible cyclist. I shouldn't really be allowed to drive a car. Um, 
So um, the idea, I, I've always kind of loathed stop motion slightly, um, but just because I don't really get it. And then, but I made this project and it became really clear that it would have to be stop motion because the objects needed to be knitted. And some of the objects are knitted by the people who they represent, you know, so Carmel was a pixie hat and she made three of them for the film, you know, in order that they represent her the best. Yeah, she is a compulsive knitter, yeah. So to go back to the to the to the creative part, you start with the idea, okay? Then you pitch the film. We don't know what exactly what could happen then, but but what is the difference between pitching the films and what comes out at the end? There must be a, a kind of art in that too, as a, as a producer and directors also. When you pitch the film, how do you how do you manage to pitch something which you don't know what what will be? I mean, you have to tell people confidently that you know what you're doing, obviously. You know, you've got to lie a little bit to get anything done. Um, I mean, you know, I was having this conversation with students the other day. They go, what goes wrong? And you go, oh, everything will probably go wrong. You kind of expect that. So you just kind of have to just, you know, be happy when you're finished. <laughs> if you yeah, finish, that feels like the massive achievement, doesn't it? Um, yeah, no, I think but it. Or maybe there's something about animation that with um, funders, and I think partly because some of our funding is arts funding, so maybe it's not necessarily so strict about this is exactly the film I'm going to make and this is exactly the film I deliver. So maybe there's a little bit more leeway with that. But I think, I think even with when you work with execs in a, like the Film Institute, they do kind of want to have some input as well. They want to have a bit of creative input. So there's always this molding and shaping that goes from the very sort of idea to the finished product, you know, there's lots of people that have opinions and lots of kind of things that will change as it goes. So I think, yeah, and that and being the producer is partly just kind of helping to make it the best it can be and make sure the director's happy and make sure everybody's happy, but mostly the director, of course. <laughs> the correct <answer. laughs> um, Yeah, I think people often talk about animated documentary as if it's like a really weird combination, like documentary is so truthful, animation lies about everything, you know, it's like, why are you being so rude about animation? Um, but in fact, I think the real kind of disconnect is that documentary is chaos and animators like, you know, we like a, a, a you know, quiet life. We like to know what's going to happen next. We like to plan. We're megalomaniacs, you know, and to give a megalomaniac chaos is to really give them a problem. So there's that lovely kind of tension between the two of something that is chaotic and needs to bring order and somebody who really wants order to impose it on. Yeah. So I think it's a kind of fascinating tension. You have a lot of artistic freedom from what we expect. And also you have a lot of artistic constraint because if you are totally free, you're paralyzed with fear and you are looking at the blank page. But what I also want to add in terms of the truth of documentary is that let's remember that truth was not invented with photography. Yeah, Before photography, before war photography, for example, there were painters that went onto the battlefield and painted. Before recording of voice, People spoke still, yes? The truth and documentary did not begin with cinema. And, and, and it may sound um, uh, a bit extreme, but I believe very strongly that photography is just as made up as, um, as animation is as well. Because, you know, when you look at, um, it's not, you know, Photoshop did not invent alterations. People used to appear and disappear for official, from official documents. People used to appear in photographs and then magically were cut away long before computers. So yes, animation is just as truthful in the same way that painting is just as truthful as well. And then you have the audience. How important is the audience in this procedure while you make your film, while you have the first idea, while you pitch it, when it's, it, it's always there and always have to be considered, but how do you feel about the audience while making it? Oh yeah, I mean the audience, you're always sort of thinking about how it will be received and testing it out. So for us, the first audience is always the collaborators. So that, that way of working where you're going back to them and saying, you know, this is how I'm representing you. This is the words I want to use. You know, this is how are we going to cut this together? How do you feel about this? And, you know, kind of getting their feedback and potentially changing things in response. And, uh, yeah, always making sure that it's very sort of sympathetic to them and uh, authentic in that sense of representing them in the best way. 
Um, but yeah, in terms of audience, you know, I mean, we'd be really curious to hear how people find these films when they see them. You know, this is first time Visible Mending will be seen with an audience. Have you seen your film with an audience yet? You have, yeah. But the, it's the first time that I will be in person, that I will be in person with an audience um, in Greece. In Greece, which okay. is very exciting. Okay. Yes, yes. So, uh, yes. Finish, wrap up, okay. Oh well, my God, I thought it's going to be longer. Anyway, um, so la it's not the last, but it's one of the last questions. How much, how, how much, how about luck? How much luck is involved in this uh, women dominated field of documentary and animated documentary? You, because I, I've, I've read that you mentioned that I was lucky. It's, it's, it's often that we hear directors who say, I was lucky to be able to get funded but for my first film, because we also have younger people who are uh, very insecure how to start, how to combine teaching or what, how they will survive only with their art. And so is, is luck the solution? No, there's no such thing as luck. I don't know, that might have been half the quote, like, I, because I do get, people do say, oh, you're lucky, and feel like getting, well, we know this, everybody in this room knows this who makes work. You know, you start with nothing, you end up with a film. That happens through just pure will. <laughs> through, you know, you have to make something out of nothing. You know, making your dinner this evening is making something out of some, you know, disparate ingredients that you randomly found in your fridge. It doesn't just come together through luck. So I think in exactly the same way, I think, Women in animated documentary, I'm not sure what the answer is. Maybe it's because it's because it's separated, like I said at the beginning, it's separated from the, you know, the more popular idea of animation as being automatically for children. And so it means that here's something serious, here's a serious area. Perhaps it's to do with talking about the self and the idiopathic, that you're talking about your very own experience that no one else can comment on, no one else can experience my lived, the, you know, my lived experience the way that I can and I can express it through film. But I don't know. What do you think? No, I agree. I mean, I don't think anything that any successes are down to luck, though. I think, you know, it's all hard work is what makes things happen and, and the right people and just networking and meeting people and getting your work out there. And, you know, it just I mean, the ice merchants is such a great example of just that kind of that hard slog to keep something going, to not give up on something, to get enough money that you can make it happen and getting it to the right festivals and just that kind of just believing in your work and, and, and working with people that will support you and believe in you. I think that's really all that you can do. But it, it, does it make a difference that we are women? I'm not sure I know any other way of being, personally. <laughs> no, I, I, you know, but I feel that there is a sense, definitely, um, what I feel very lucky about is that I have met other wonderful you know women directors and producers of animated documentary and i've had wonderful conversations and i've met really interesting people that want to watch those films so it's actually like there is a community there and that's what i feel is the most exciting thing also you learn to be a filmmaker because you go to festivals and that's when you get really hungry for making films and for watching them together with other people so it's a cycle and we are in, in one of these fantastic f festivals where these films are going to be screened. So I guess we have to finish here. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Ah, yes, the Q&A, of course. Okay, we have so 10 minutes. Eh? Let's give the let's floor to the, the floor. audience. Questions? Yes, Joanna. Yes. Um, that was great, thank you. Uh, question for Sam. Something that has always, um, I've always wondered, like how on earth you do it? You had twin boys, um, you've always had a full-time job doing teaching. How do you find the time to make so many films and do a PhD? Do you deliberately have to carve out time for yourself? How do you oh, do God. it? I mean, I, I, yeah, so I've always taught part-time. Um, um, Katerina and I both teach at the Royal College of Art where Abigail also comes in to do guest lecturing as well. Um, but 
I've always, my teaching has always been part-time and I've always jealously guarded those days that weren't teaching in order. Plus, we're very privileged when you teach in higher education in the UK, you get 20 or 25% of your time is research time. And for us as practitioner researchers, our practice is our research, so we, we can do that in that time. And I think it's just being, um, yeah, just, well, you know, as, as, you know, right back at you, girl. Yeah. Uh, can it's, I answer it's a question to, because of, uh, of UK? because all of you are in the UK, it's the answer for that. Can I answer with a slightly sad answer? Uh, um, recently, my daughter, who is 11 years old, showed me, made a drawing, and the drawing shows her saying, Mommy, can I show you something? And I am in the picture in front of a computer saying, Sorry, darling, I am working now. <laughs> so, no, that is true, you know, I have sacrificed a lot of my personal life because I work from home and I'm able to work around the clock. So, you know, that is why I love doing animation and that is why not everybody loves me doing animation. But, you know, there is, I don't think there is a life balance. I think there's always uh, times of winning and times of losing, to be realistic. Yeah. Other people maybe are doing it better. <laughs> Hi, thank you. Uh, you mentioned that sometimes the story takes you in a different direction than what you had originally thought. And I wanted to ask how attached you are to the original idea and when, how do you know when to stop being so attached and follow a different narrative She needs two mics for this. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. Um, yeah, no, it's a really excellent question. And I think, I think with every film or with every work that you make, you have a central inciting idea that is, your, is the thing you want to express. And it's not always the story. Sometimes it's just something really... So the very first film I made was called Success with Sweet Peas, about competitive sweet pea growers in Shropshire. But really what the film was about was obsession. I was obsessed with the idea that people were so obsessed with growing flowers in rows. And so it didn't really matter. Like with um, the film I just made about knitting, it was about knitting and what that does in your brain. But it could easily have been about singing, and it was almost was about singing, but I couldn't think of a good reason to animate that. Um, so um, it's it, so there is stuff that is movable and there is stuff that is central. And as long as you're clear about what's important, that you don't throw away that really that, that is the thing that made you want to do the film. But as Abigail said, you know, you must, which is why I always say, you have to kill your darlings, you know, that sometimes you get a beautiful shot and you love it, but it, it doesn't follow the path of the film in the way that it ends up so you need to get rid of it I find that really liberating I find that a really fun but I realize it's a bit weird I think of making films uh, what Joao said earlier that uh, there is an image that uh, guides him I think it's really interesting because for me uh, it comes almost the other way around I start making a film like I am in a blurry place and suddenly I'm waiting by making and making, I wait until things start to sharpen, or like I'm in a dark place and I start shining lights around until I start, until I see that thing. And then when I see it and I feel something and it's like, you know, it's like my little Eureka moment, I hold on to that image and, and it, it guides me, it becomes my Ithaca, you know, and I sort of travel towards it. It just means that you have to be really strict with yourself so you can't, if, if, you, you have to listen to the voice that says, oh no, this isn't going well, so that you know that, okay, I need to change, I need to do something, I need to change this. Not change the idea, that's the biggest mistake people make, because they keep doubting the idea. No, when the image doesn't work the way you want, return to it, keep playing, keep exhausting the possibilities. And just work very hard until things start making sense, which means it's not going to be the first thing, it's probably going to be the tenth thing. But once you find it, grab it. Thank you. But in practical terms, when you say grab your image and go uh, navigate through uh, to it, 
Do you start with sound? Do you start with interviews? Do you start with images? Do you start with um, post-it notes? How do you each approach the sculpting of the film? Per personally, I start sculpting the film. You know, either I make, because I work with CGI, I tend to create the room or the planet of the film. And then I, docu and then I work inside it as if I am a documentarian and I've discovered this planet, and I take a camera and I start traveling inside it. So sometimes I take pictures. It's like a, a, a camera person going on a recce. So I carry my camera and I go and I take pictures and I'm like, hey, that looks cool. How is it gonna look if I go and if I change the lens or if I look under it or if I change the light? The good thing about working with sound, if for example, in the case of this film with a poem, is it means that I can constrain myself, so I'm not going to make a feature because I don't have time to make a feature. So to, to starting with a, for example, if you have a voiceover with the voiceover and editing it, means that you're not going to go completely wild and make a film that will never finish. It's constrained. Um, I start with data, just tons and tons and tons and tons of data, and just like getting as much information as possible. So reading loads of articles and just immersing myself in it. And it takes ages, it takes years. And, you know, but also in talking to as many people. So Abigail and I have made two films together, which I would, I would consider to be animated documentaries, which are treasure in a language of shapes, but neither of them has dialogue in them. But I still talked to loads of people and I recorded loads of people, but I ended up using it, but it was implicit in the images. I mean, hopefully it's explicit to an audience as well, but you know, it was kind of, it's just that sifting, sifting, sifting of information. It's, yeah, I, I, I know I've mentioned the word masochism, but it should feature more highly in the process. How long does this process take normally? Depends on how long how long you've got to do. The yeah. okay. I mean, you know, you can do it. You can do it in a really short amount of time, but it does nearly kill you. It, it needs a space. So it needs space. Yeah. So I would say, ideally, you need like it needs to be measured in a, in a couple of years, really, to, in order to kind of really immerse yourself and then come out the other side with something that's meaningful and is going to connect to an audience. So. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. I'm going to tell them how you work, yeah. <laughs> no, but yeah, just in practical terms, I mean, it's like you're saying, you've got all the research, you're talking to the scientists, you're going, I've read this paper you wrote, and, you know, questioning them on it or whatever. But then it's like having to then distill that into a very, you know, like a one-page outline and just like, well, what is this film going to be? Again, knowing the constraints of time and money, like what is realistic, six, seven, eight minutes for an animated short and obviously audience attention span and that kind of thing. And yeah, just kind of like looking at it from that sense. And most people I work with don't tend to storyboard, they tend to go straight from like a treatment either into a script or in, straight into an animatic. And you know, all animation is just constantly editing as you go anyway. So you've got the animatic and as you're adding, you know, you're kind of mostly dealing with the most important key information. And then sometimes some of the other stuff gets stripped out as you're going, which is a bit about the thing about killing your darlings. It's like you, as you go, you realize what is the most important things that really kind of drive your film forward and what things you can afford to lose really. And that's also about audience testing. So that's why having a producer is useful. Maybe not always, but you know, sometimes it's like that you have the other person that can kind of give a feedback from an audience perspective. But then sometimes when you're working on films together for a long time, you know, you get an editor in or you go and yeah, show it to a room full of people and say, we think this works. We've been working on this for three years. What do you think? You know, so yeah. Um. Thank you very much. This was very inspiring. Um, I have a bit of a weird question. It's not so practical. Um, having worked with the chaos of reality, the order of animation, uh, reality being, I mean, technically more real and animation more, uh, uh, I don't know, fantastic. Uh, after all these years of mixing the two, um, did anything change? over the course of your career uh, to your perception of reality? Like how you understand, like your perception of reality, I don't know. Uh, it's interesting because you have this very unique uh, take. Yeah, I think that's, 
I think that's a bonkers question and I live for it. Um, I think that my grasp of reality has always been very limited and I think it's become more skewed as I have become older. Uh, I, I don't know. Um, I think that the reality, I think it's that thing that Herzog says as well, that there is the, the truth of accountants and then there is poetic truth. Uh -huh. But to be honest, I love the truth of accountants as well. You know, like, like Georges Perec, who I love dearly, made such beautiful books and films and radio plays and everything by using a grid, you know, by repeat, by working as a mathematician. You know, there's, I just think that you have to find your poetry and the one thing that surprises me sometimes from people that I, that I know like, that make films is you have to watch films as well. Like you have to watch a lot of films and, and not necessarily watch, read a lot of poems, like be inspired by other people and, 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 um, and repeat them and find your own way of dancing into the, into the world. Do you think that we women, we navigate easier in the different modes of perception of reality from emotional to physical to intellectual to spiritual? I, I mean, when I say I don't know any other way, I think that, I think that, um, I, I think that there's probably just as many men that are just as poetic and just as uh, spiritual and, you know, um, I, I, I don't, I don't know what it is. I think there is a, I think the problem is more in terms of, and maybe the reason that there's a lot more women independence is because there is less male domination in, like, you can do things independently and you don't have to convince people that expect you to be, uh, you know, that expect boys to do it better. I don't know. But I've met a poetic and sensitive and incredibly, you know, spiritual, uh, men as uh, as women. I just don't know any other, uh, you know, that, that's... <laughs> we have to wrap up, I'm sorry. <laughs> we, we would like to stay forever. <laughs> Thank you so much. You can uh, watch uh, both films on Saturday evening at Apollon Theatre. Thank you.